Our next speaker is Scott Aronson from MIT, who will be telling us about black holes, firewalls, and the complexity of states and unitaries. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Stephen. It's uh, great to be here. So uh, that's uh, uh, what you get if you uh, search Google for quantum computer and if you search it for black hole. Uh, that, uh, whether that's what either of them look like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you to say. So, uh, uh, sorry, so it may seem uh, 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 sort of uh, 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 absurd that there would be a, you know, a connection between black holes and computational complexity. I think that for the majority of the time that I've been in this field, you know, this is something that we would make wisecracks about. About, you know, you know, like we have quantum computers. What about you know bla what's black hole polynomial time? You know, well, you know, uh, you know, in who in whose you know in whose reference frame is it even you know the time? What if you know the answer but you can never tell your friends because you're trapped inside a black hole? You know, so. Um, uh, so, so it was one of I think one of the uh, the thrills of, of my career when uh, you know a, a few years ago uh, Daniel Harlow and Patrick Hayden uh, 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 wrote a paper that uh, uh, you know I think made a, a pretty serious connection uh, you know using computational complexity to uh, uh, give new insights into the black hole information problem and uh, this uh, was uh, at the same time that uh, that uh, there was there's uh, there was work by by Lenny Susskind and uh, and others making similar connections, and so I hope to uh, tell you a little bit about this story, uh, tell you some of the recent progress uh, that um, that I and others have been have been able to make, and this is uh, um, um, unfortunately stuff that's still not on the archive, but uh, uh, in the process of being written up. And um, you know, and sort of just try to show you why I I sort of had 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 no choice but to become interested in these connections, and uh, and maybe uh, may, uh, maybe you'll have no choice as well. All right. So the first thing I have to do is uh, review uh, 40 years of black hole history, and uh, I'm going to uh, do that in one slide, pretty much. Okay. So. Um, uh, so, uh, so our story starts in the 1970s when uh, Jacob Beckenstein, uh, you know, uh, sadly uh, uh, passed away uh, about a month ago, and uh, and Stephen Hawking uh, uh, made their seminal discovery that uh, black holes have an entropy, you know, and they have a non-zero temperature. Okay, and they emit radiation. They eventually uh, radiate themselves away. They're not completely black. Okay, but uh, this gave rise to the famous in information loss problem, uh, which is, you know, the same uh, calculation in quantum field theory and curved space-time that Hawking did that tells you that the Hawking radiation uh, exists in the first place also suggests that this radiation should be completely thermal. Okay, it should be uh, totally in a mixed state, you know, uncorrelated with uh, the actual quantum state of the information that fell into the hole. Okay, and so uh, to a faraway observer, a black hole would seem to be a system that evolves a pure state into a mixed state. Okay, so uh, it's a uh, uh, um, a lossy channel, I guess, or a non-unitary channel. Okay, uh, but uh, this um, uh, this is a problem. This you know seems to violate quantum mechanics. Okay, you know, unless you believe that there's some other inaccessible region of the universe where the qubits. Uh, can go, you know, you know, they they ought to come out somehow, right? They ought to, uh, uh, you know, if, if if we believe in uh, uh, the unitarity of the laws of physics, okay. Uh, so all right, you know, but you know, uh, uh, um, you know, f f uh, uh, I guess you know, quantum gravity theorists are resourceful. You know, you can always just uh, you can always just push everything you don't know onto you know a yet to be discovered quantum theory of gravity okay and uh, can always just say well look you know once we discover the true laws of quantum gravity we'll see that you know quant uh, quantum field theory was only an approximation to them and yes you know uh, uh, at, you know ultimately everything is unitary you know you drop it a qubit you know and it's and it's really not not that different in principle from you know uh, 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 you know throwing a piece of paper into a fire, you know, the information may be, you know, harder to retrieve in practice, but, you know, but in principle it will still be there. Okay, but, um, 
Uh, but this then led to other problems uh, in, in the 80s. Okay, so, uh, so people worried about, well, let's say I take a qubit, you know, I drop it into a, a black hole, then I stay outside the black hole for a while. You know, I wait for, uh, for, for, for enough Hawking radiation to come out so that I can information theoretically uh, reconstruct the qubit that came in. Okay, so now I, I found it again. Okay, and then immediately I jump into the black hole. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm really committed to science, okay? And, uh, and, and I go look for the second copy of the, you know, and, you know, but, you know, and I, and I, and I go look, you know, well, the, 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 you know, the qubit should also still be in the black hole because, you know, to an observer who was inside, right, it's, you know, it's never going to come out. And so then I see two copies of the same qubit, right? And this violates the no cloning theorem. Okay, but then uh, people did calculations that said, look, you know, by the time uh, the first copy of the qubit could be reconstructed from the Hawking radiation, the second copy would have long ago hit the singularity. So, you know, no, no, no one's actually going to observe a violation of the no cloning theorem. So, okay, you know, you can sleep easy. Maybe there's, no, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, but then, you know, other people said, well, wait a minute, you know, just because we can't observe a violation, you know, I mean, like, what is the actual structure of the Hilbert space here, right? You know, it's... Uh, um, you know, it, it, it seems, uh, you know, it, 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 it all seems kind of loosey-goosey. Okay, so, uh, so, so these kinds of problems led to the perspective uh, that's, uh, that's called black hole complementarity, uh, which was developed by uh, various people like Susskind and uh, at Hooft in the, in the 90s. And uh, complementarity, you know, actually says something very radical. Uh, it says that... Um, uh, in some sense, you know, the, the, the reason why there was no, uh, no cloning violation here is that, you know, the, the qubit that is, you know, inside of the black hole is not, uh, uh, is not a separate qubit. You know, is not different from the qubit that you know uh, could you know would be let's say encoded on the event horizon or that could come out of the black hole. Actually, you know, they're just literally the same qubit, but just measured in different bases. Okay, so so from this point of view, uh, jumping into a black hole is just you know a very. Uh, strange or convoluted way of measuring uh, the same quantum states, the same degrees of freedom that you could have measured uh, while staying outside the black hole. Okay, uh, they're just, they're different re-encodings of the same information. They're not two different, uh, uh, you know, parts of Hilbert space in, in tensor product with each other. Okay, now, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, so, so th this sort of became the sort of accepted view for, you know, since the 90s, and I never understood it, okay? It never made any sense to me, but, you know, uh, I assumed, okay, but, you know, that's, that's you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, I mean, obviously it wouldn't, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, this is, this, is, this is really deep quantum gravity, you know, and uh, uh, what changed in 2012 with this firewall problem is that the experts uh, agreed that they didn't understand it either. And uh, so, uh, so this gives rise to this uh, uh, firewall problem. So let me describe this to you. Okay, and uh, uh, I think the, the, new, um, the new thing here is that there is an actual experiment, you know, that one could at least uh, imagine doing. You know, I don't recommend trying it. Okay, but, uh, but you know, the, accept, the accepted views about black holes, if you put them all together, seem to lead to an absurd result for this experiment. Okay, so it, it sort of heightens uh, the stakes and that, you know, now like, you know, you, you know, like e e everyone in this business wants to claim that like everything is fine, you know, Quantum mechanics is fine, general relativity is fine, quantum field theory is fine, you know, just go home, stop worrying about it, right? You know, no, no, no two people agree about why you should, you know, uh, stop worrying about it, but that's, you know, but that's what, you know, everyone wants to say. Okay, but, but now, uh, you know, you have to, uh, you know, if you, if you claim to understand what's going on, then you have to be able to say what would happen if someone did this experiment. What would they experience? Right, and so that, that sort of raises the stakes a little. Okay, so what is this experiment? Uh, so, um, all right, so we, we consider three cis, uh, uh, um, uh, um, 
systems. Uh, um, um, H is the interior of a black hole, and we'll take this to be an old black hole, meaning one that is uh, uh, radiated, take most of its mass away uh, into uh, the Hawking radiation already. Okay, so there, you know, for an astrophysical mass black hole, it would take about 10 to the 67 years uh, until that happened. Okay, but, you know, we'll assume that, you know, you uh, you got a really long NSF grant, okay? I'm sure you know there. Are, I'm sure that there are people in this room who know how to how to wrangle that kind of thing, okay? But um, uh, now R uh, is the um, far away Hawking radiation, okay? It's uh, you know radiation that that's been emitted a while ago. It's it's now out. And then B is some Hawking radiation that is just now coming out of the hull. Okay, and so uh, for simplicity in this talk, I'll often take B to just uh, consist of a single qubit. Okay, and, um, and now we've got our observer, Alice, uh, and, um, uh, and the first claim is that uh, just, you know, uh, staying entirely outside of the, of the uh, event horizon, okay, so we're now, you know, in a regime of relatively well understood physics, you know, she's not jumping into the black hole yet, okay, but, uh, you know, if uh, the black hole is old enough, then she should be able to observe, uh, in principle, that R and B are entangled. Okay. Uh, in fact, that they are they're maximally entangled. That you know she should be able to distill an EPR pair between R and B by applying some unitary transformation uh, to R only. Okay. Now, why is that? Okay. Well, I claim there, there's there's a reason for this, which is just a totally generic uh, quantum information theory reason. It has nothing to do with the specifics of black holes. Okay, the reason is, so first of all, you know, we've assumed that uh, whatever are the dynamics of a black hole, they are unitary. Okay, so, uh, so, so, so the qubits that have come in, let's say it's n qubits, you know, have just been scrambled up in some way, okay, but, but only via unitary transformation. Okay, um, and then, um, it is, uh, uh, you know, it is a very safe assumption, you know, that whatever are the, the unitary dynamics that the black hole uh, uh, affects on those qubits, they're going to scramble things up a lot. You know, the information that comes out will be uh, very, very scrambled, you know, uh, very, you know, unrecognizable, okay? Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, th throwing something into a black hole seems like much, much more extreme than burning it, okay? Okay, but now, now just imagine that we take a sort of generic quantum state on n qubits. Uh, um, so, you know, you, you could think, if you like, of a Haar random state, okay, although it doesn't actually have to be Haar random. It could be, you know, a, a K design or, or, or uh, the output of a small random quantum circuit or something like that, okay? And now uh, imagine that you take uh, uh, nine-tenths of, uh, of the qubits, let's say, and you look at are, they, are those qubits entangled with some one other qubit? Okay, and then it's not hard to see that the answer will generically be yes. Okay, why? Uh, because um, uh, just because of the way that random states work, right? The you know the one tenth of the qubits that uh, that we're tracing out uh, just you know are just not enough to you know uh, to to completely uh, mix everything up to, you know, to make the reduced state of the qubits that we are observing uh, the maximally mixed state, right? Of course, you know, if, if at least half of the qubits were being traced out, then the qubits we're looking at would be maximally mixed, and so then there wouldn't be entanglement. Okay, but if we're tracing out uh, less than half of the qubits, then the ones that we're looking at will be some, you know, kind of random state in a very high dimensional Hilbert space, which is not completely mixed. And generically, that kind of thing is going to have, you know, in, yes, entanglement between, you know, one, one of its qubits and any of the others. All right. So, um, so that's just purely an information theoretic argument. Uh, but it, it's, it says that in principle, there's some unitary Alice can apply for which she could then measure, you know, and see that there is a Bell pair between R and B. Okay. So now, you know, she's, she has con experimentally confirmed that, you know, that, uh, 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 you know that 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 black holes are uh, unitary; that they don't destroy information. Okay, but that's not the troubling part yet. 
Okay, next, next, she, you know, for the next phase, she's going to jump into the black hole. Okay, and and now, you know, there's a part that uh, relies on quantum field theory. That you know, if you don't, uh, uh, if you don't know quantum field theory, you'll have to take my word for it, as you know, as I, as I take others' word for it. Okay, and uh, and this is that uh, you know the the uh, vacuum in quantum field theory is very very highly entangled. Okay, and uh, in particular, uh, in order for Alice to see a smooth vacuum as she falls through the event horizon. In order for her to see anything like the vacuum that classical GR, you know, and low energy field theory would predict for her, uh, she has to also be able to see uh, a near maximal entanglement between B and H between B and, you know, like a photon of Hawking radiation that's just coming out and some partner photon, which should be just inside of the event horizon. Okay, but now we have a problem because, uh, because now Alice would observe a violation of the monogamy of entanglement. Okay, she would have to, you know, uh, we've predicted that she has to, uh, you know, be able to measure the same qubit as being maximally entangled with two other qubits. Okay, and this is not just some thought experiment, this is what Alice actually sees as she jumps in. Okay, so, you know, there's uh, a bunch of different ways out. You know, you could just deny that, you know, black holes uh, 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 are, are unitary, you know, and then there's no problem, but, you know, except, you, except that you've given up on the reversibility of the laws of physics, you know, that we've had since Galileo and Newton. Okay, uh, or, you know, you could... Um, uh, you could say that, look, you know, uh, you know, it is not even the job of science to talk about what happens when, you know, after Alex, a a a after Alice jumps uh, into the black hole, because, you know, black holes are like Vegas, right? What happens there stays there. You know, she can't, she can't publish a paper about it, or at least, you know, she could only publish a paper for her friends, you know, who are also in the black hole to read. Okay, so, uh, so we, you know, so this is not, you know, this is like life after death. This is not empirical, right? Uh, but, you know, but that seems kind of unsatisfactory, you know, given that classical GR perfectly well tells you what happens after you're past the event horizon, and it's not even that extraordinary ordinary, you know, until you get near the singularity. Okay, so, um, so, so a, th a third uh, option would be to say, well, look, what is going to happen is that space-time will just end right at the event horizon, long before uh, Alice hits the singularity, right? This is the only way out that, you know, because there's entanglement here in the one place, there cannot be entanglement in the other, and if, because there's no entanglement, there must be an end of space-time there. So this is what's called the firewall, okay? Um, so, uh, um, so there are, you know, so these are all perspectives people have taken. Uh, you know, to my mind, you know, one of one of the most interesting perspectives to me is one that's sort of uh, 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 crystallized with this work by uh, uh, Suskind and Maldacena on the ER equals EPR uh, correspondence. And basically, uh, th this point of view says uh, yes. If Alice did this, you know, bizarre experiment, you know, involving this this weird measurement on the Hawking radiation, then she could create a firewall. Okay, but if she doesn't do the experiment, you know, if she just jumps into the black hole in normal circumstances, then there's not going to be a firewall. Then she's just going to see normal, you know, what normal GR and and, and QFT would predict. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and this, you know, th this makes sense if we really take black hole complementarity seriously, right? If you believe that what is inside of the black hole is just some scrambled re-encoding of the qubits that are already uh, uh, in the, uh, on the event horizon and in the Hawking radiation, well, then there must be some unitary uh, that could be applied to the Hawking radiation, you know, to the exterior qubits that would totally mess up the interior of the black hole. Okay, and so then, you know, we're saying, well, you know, to uh, do this AMPS experiment, you know, that uh, th that is such a unitary. Okay, and... Um 
but now, uh, uh, you know, the, the problem sort of shifts. Okay, and the, the, the question is, well, w w what do we mean by ordinary circumstances, right? Uh, you know, just how weird, you know, uh, how, how weird uh, is, you know, the thing that Alice has to do before uh, a firewall uh, would appear? In this account, okay, and you know the 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 point is, you know, we all knew that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, everyone agreed that quantum field theory would break down, you know, if you could do experiments that were at the Planck scale, right? That you would need a quantum theory of gravity to say what what would happen then, okay? But you know, Alice is now doing, uh, you know, uh, she she's not doing any uh, high energy measurement in this experiment, right? She's just doing a bunch of manipulations of these uh, uh, Hawking radiation qubits. And somehow that creates a firewall. So what, what is it that's extreme about what Alice is doing, you know, in the, in the first stage of this experiment? Okay, so what Harlow and Hayden said is that what's extreme about it is that she's doing a unitary transformation uh, that, that should be exponentially hard even for a quantum computer. Okay. Um, so they, they gave an argument that the decoding task measuring the entanglement between R and B uh, should take time which is exponential in the number of qubits uh, in the black hole. Okay, so we're not talking about 10 to the 67 years here. Uh, we're talking about 2 to the 10 to the 67 years. Okay, and so then, you know, you could say, well, in that case, long before Alice had made a dent on this problem, the black hole would have evaporated anyway. So, you know, so once again, we're, you know, we're, 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 you know, we're sort of okay, no problem, right? So, uh, so this was, you know, a, I, I think a, a very novel uh, uh, attempted, you know, proposed use of complexity theory in fundamental physics, you know, that, uh, sort of we're, we're saying that, you know, it's okay if quantum field theory breaks down not only in the limit of extreme energies, but also in the limit of exponential computational complexity. Yeah? Who's what? Who's the time of the external observer. Okay, so, you know, so now a lot of people, you know, are, are, are very uncomfortable about that, which, you know, I think, you know, to some extent you should be. I mean, you know, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, 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 but it's important to understand what Harlow and Hayden are not saying, okay? So a lot of people have, have caricatured it by saying, well, you know, they're saying it's okay to have a contradiction in the laws of physics as long as it would take exponential time to uncover it. Okay, that, that, that's not what they're saying at all, okay? Presumably, you know, the true quantum theory of gravity, whatever it is, is perfect consistent, you know, uh, uh, you know, gives well-defined answers to any, you know, meaningful question you could ask and so forth, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but low energy quantum field theory, like we already knew that it would have problems if you pushed it hard enough, you know, in the, to the extreme of high enough energy, for example, and this is saying, well, it could also have problems if you push it to the extreme of, you know, uh, 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 imagining that you could solve an exponentially hard problem. Okay, yeah. So let me be a little bit more formal. So, uh, so how did uh, Harlow and Hayden uh, formalize this task of uh, uh, performing the AMPS experiment or decoding the entanglement between uh, the uh, the R and B uh, uh, regions? Okay. So first of all, they said, look, you know, a black hole is some finite collection of qubits. All right, you know, they, 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 uh, they've already won my heart. You know, and. Um, and, 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 and whatever are the dynamics of the black hole, you know, they would presumably correspond to some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, uh, um, uh, 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 local Hamiltonian, you know, being integrated over time, right, which by trotterization we could just treat as some polynomial sized quantum circuit. Okay, some sequence of gates that are acting. Okay, and we will assume, let, 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 you know, since this is a thought experiment, uh, let's assume that we know the complete state of the matter that, that collapsed to form the black hole. Okay, and you know, and, and it was some simple state. Well, we'll think of it as like the all zero state, for example. Okay, and we know the complete laws of physics that are relevant, which means we know a complete description of this polynomial sized quantum circuit, C. Okay, so C acting on the all zero state uh, uh, pre 
prepares some pure state psi on these three regions, R, B, and H. Okay, and now we're given a promise about psi. Okay, not a very strong one. We're promised that by acting only on R, you know, the Hawking radiation part, it is possible to distill an EPR pair uh, between R and B. Okay, so there is maximal entanglement between R and B. And again, I'm going to treat B as being just a single qubit here. Okay? Okay, and now the, 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 the task is going to be to actually distill such an EPR pair by acting only on R. So you have to apply some unitary U sub R that puts, let's say, the last qubit of R into an EPR pair with B. Okay? Uh, so now, you know, some people will say this, will, will, so some people will look at this and they'll say, well, you know, the decoding, you know, sounds pretty easy, right? Uh, uh, I mean, you know, you could just, uh, uh, you could, you could, um, um, you know, you could, you could start out by just inverting C and, you know, just getting back to the all zero state and then you could go from there. Okay, the problem with any approach of that kind is that uh, uh, you, uh, once again, you only have access to the qubits in R and B, not to the ones in H. Okay, so, you know, this corresponds to, you know, Alice cannot access the qubits that are still inside the black hole. Right, she can only access the part that's already come out. Uh, as Hawking radiation. Okay, and, and the interesting point is that, you know, we, uh, before I, I sort of uh, sketched an argument uh, that, uh, that after the black hole is more than halfway evaporated, then information theoretically, Alice will be able to distill entanglement, you know, between R and B. They will be entangled states. Okay, but the argument that I gave was purely information theoretic, right? It, uh, it, was, it was purely based on dimension counting. Okay, so, uh, so, so it didn't actually, the argument I gave that R and B are entangled, you know, did not suggest any efficient quantum circuit that would actually uh, distill entanglement between R and B. You know, of course, it didn't prove that no such circuit could exist, okay, but it's at least suggestive of that. Okay, but, you know, Harlow and Hayden were not content to stop there. They wanted to give a reduction, you know, showing that, that uh, uh, you know, th they wanted to give better evidence that this problem actually is hard. Okay, so, uh, so this is not the way that they stated their result, okay, but it's, it's the way that I like to state it. Uh, we can state it in terms of um, a black box problem uh, such as set equality. Okay, set equality, well, I guess it has both a, 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 there's a variant where F and G are oracles, there's also a variant where F and G are efficiently computable. Okay, you can, you can uh, uh, take either version that you like, but, uh, but you're basically, you're given two functions, F and G, each of which maps N bits to some polynomial number of bits. Okay, and we're promised that the ranges of F and G uh, are either equal or they're disjoint. Okay? And the task is to decide which, okay, with bounded probability of error. Okay, so this is a, you know, a basic problem in quantum query complexity. Now, uh, one of the things that I did uh, in this uh, collision lower bound uh, that I proved in 2002 was to show that uh, this problem, uh, set equality, which is, this is like a variant of the collision problem uh, uh, where, um, uh, where, where you know, you're, 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 it's sort of not totally permutation symmetric, right? You're promised that you've got these two different functions, f and g. Uh, but I was able to prove a two to the n over seven uh, lower bound on the quantum query complexity of this uh, set equality problem. Uh, now, um, uh, that was recently uh, improved uh, to a two to the, you know, I think now we can prove a, the, a lower bound of two to the n over three uh, by uh, Mark Jandry's work, okay, and, and that's tight, you know, Bersard, Hoyer, and Tapp gave a matching uh, algorithm, uh, which sort of combines Grover's algorithm uh, with the birthday attack. Okay, so, um, so, so the bottom line is that we know that at least in the black box setting, uh, even a quantum computer needs exponential time to solve set equality. Okay, now even uh, in the non-black box setting, one can give reductions saying, for example, if you had a polynomial time quantum algorithm for set equality, then that would immediately imply a polynomial time quantum algorithm for graph isomorphism. 
Okay, and you know, if, if the algorithm were a little bit more general than that, it would let you find collisions in you know, cryptographic hash functions, and do all kinds of things like that. Okay, so now here's the, uh, the main theorem of Harlow and Hayden. That, you know, suppose that there's a polynomial time quantum algorithm to solve that HH decoding task of distilling the entanglement between R and B. Then there is also a polynomial time quantum algorithm for set equality. Okay, uh, so you know, so the reduction is is pretty simple. Uh, you know, it's basically you know it involves considering a state like that one there. Okay, so um, uh, or you know, at least this is this is this is one way to do it. Okay, uh, so so in the Hawking radiation, I've put an equal superposition over all two to the n possible inputs x uh, to f into g. Okay, I've also put. A, uh, a qubit that I've sort of given away for free to you is the one that should be entangled with B. Uh, so, uh, you know, and then in B, I have, I just have this one qubit that, you know, uh, is sort of classically correlated with that last qubit, you know, of, of R, you know, at least. Uh, well, you know, say um, maybe, it's, maybe it's entangled, maybe it's uh, only classically correlated. And then uh, in, inside the black hole, I have the evaluations of F and G. Okay, depending on whether these, bit, these bits are zero or one. Okay, now let's look at the state, okay, and, and ask, is there actually entanglement between, okay, certainly the state is easy to prepare, you know, if I have access to F and G. Okay, but let's ask, is there entanglement between R and B in this state, or isn't there? Um, all right, well, you know, intuitively, if F, if, if F and G have disjoint ranges, then the H register uh, decoheres all the entanglement between R and B, leaving only classical correlation. On the other hand, if F and G have equal ranges, then there's some permutation of the X states, you know, the X uh, uh, the, the, that puts the last qubit of R into an EPR pair with B. So, so then, so, so then there is entanglement. Okay. So, if you had a general procedure to distill the entanglement whenever it was there, then you could apply that procedure to a state like this one. Okay. Then check to see whether you had, you know, put R and B into a, 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 a create a bell pair between them. If you had, then you would know that F and G had equal ranges. Otherwise, if you failed, then you would know that they had disjoint ranges. So you would be solving the set equality problem. Okay. All right. So, so, my, uh, uh, so, so I gave a strengthening of uh, Harlow and Hayden's result so that no longer requires the uh, collision lower bound. Uh, now you merely have to assume that there is some one-way function which is hard to invert using a quantum computer. Okay, which you know seems like a, a, a safer assumption, and uh, an additional advantage of, uh, of 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 my reduction is that uh, uh, you need to invert a one-way function even just to observe classical correlation between the R and B registers, let alone entanglement. Okay, so uh, so my reduction uh, uses uh, you know you take a one-way function f, which now f of x is going to be in the Hawking radiation, and and x is going to be in Inside the black hole, so it's the other way around. And uh, in um, in the B register is going to be what's called the uh, Goldreich-Levin uh, hardcore predicate of the one-way function. Okay, that is just some bit about the input x, which is hard to predict anything better by by any uh, uh, probability better than chance if all you know is f of x. Okay, and uh, it's a famous theorem of Goldreich and Levin from the 1980s that every one-way function, you know, has a hardcore predicate, or you know, at least can be modified to, uh, uh, so, uh, so that it has one. Okay, you know, and I love you know Goldreich and Levin are two of the the biggest you know disbelievers in quantum computing, but we can still use their theorem. And uh, uh, so um, so basically, uh, you know, you can just you could just stare at this a while, and what you find is that uh, if, um, you know, in order to even uh, uh, observe classical correlation between R and B, you're going to have to be able to guess the hardcore bit better than chance, you know, and then, but then by Goldreich Levin, that would uh, uh, break the one way function. So, you know, you're led to this picture that I, I really enjoy, where computational intractability is the sort of armor uh, protecting the geometry of space time inside of a black hole.
All right, so in the remaining few minutes, I'd like to tell you about a second connection uh, between complexity and black holes. And this is work in progress by me and Lenny Susskind. Okay, and this involves this um, ADS-CFT correspondence, which is uh, uh, a relationship between um, uh, a quantum gravity theory in a D space-time dimensions, you know, in an anti-de-sitter space, uh, and a conformal field theory, which is sort of a more or less ordinary quantum theory, you can think of it as just, you know, a bunch of qubits being acted on by some unitary, uh, which lives in uh, D minus uh, one space-time dimensions. Okay, it's a very, very non-local mapping. In fact, there's recent work that says, that, you know, you can literally view ADS-CFT as an example of a quantum error correcting code. Uh, okay, but now um, let's say that you take some system, you know, on the ADS side, like two regions of sp uh, space that are connected uh, only by a wormhole, okay, and, uh, you know, and classical GR basically predicts in such a case that this wormhole is just going to get longer and longer and longer without limit, okay, depending on which coordinates you work in, it will either uh, get longer forever or it will pinch off after some finite time. Uh, now, uh, now, let's say that you go take that system and you look at its CFT dual. Okay, so you look at what quantum state, you know, in the ordinary quantum field theory does this gravitational system get mapped to? Okay, and it gets mapped to something like this. Uh, so you have n entangled qubits, and the, you know, the, the wormhole corresponds to the entanglement between the qubits. This is the uh, uh, Susskind and Maldacena's famous ER equals EPR thing. Okay, and the lengthening of the wormhole uh, corresponds to some unitary transformation which is just acting over and over again to, you know, to scramble up, uh, you know, the, the way in which these qubits are entangled, okay? Um, uh, so, so, then, so, so, so then a few years ago, uh, Lenny asked the question, uh, if you look at the state on the CFT side, what observable can you point to, or what, uh, what quantity can you point to, uh, which, which uh, is dual to the length of the wormhole? Right, so you have this geometric thing, the length of the wormhole, but on the CFT side, you know, you just have a bunch of qubits that seem to be getting more and more scrambled up. So, uh, so, so what, what is it about these qubits, you know, that's sort of keeping track of the wormhole's length? But, you know, if the two theories are dual, there must be something. Okay, and uh, Lenny noticed that, that, well, you know, if you just look at, like, the, uh, um, you know, the k-point correlation functions or something like that, or any kind of local observable, it's going to just uh, uh, very, very quickly saturate and then become uninteresting because, you know, it's just like if I have uh, gas in a box, right, it will just very quickly reach a thermal equilibrium and then by any, you know, you know any ordinary physical quantity, you know, after that point has sort of ceased to change much. Okay, you know, until, you know, the Poincaré time, you know, maybe it will undergo some recurrence, okay, but at least for an exponential amount of time, you know, it, it, it will no longer change. Okay, uh, but, you know, but meanwhile, on the ADS side, the wormhole is still getting longer. So there must be some property of this quantum state that is continuing to change. Okay, well, in some sense, we know that there is because, you know, this is still a pure state. It's continuing to evolve uh, unitarily uh, through Hilbert space. Uh, but, you know, but we would like some function of the state that, that, that um, matches the, the wormhole length. So Lenny's proposal was to look at the quantum circuit complexity of the state. Okay, this is, you know, just the minimum number of gates that you would need to prepare the state uh, if you started from the all zero state. Okay, um, so, you know, so that, so that is something that at least it's plausible, you know, will continue to go up and up and up, right? Because after all, you're continuing to apply more and more unitary evolution and if, all your quantum circuit did was to recapitulate that unitary evolution, well then it would have to get longer, you know, larger and larger uh, as T increased. Okay, uh, so, um, you know, so, 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 um, 
you know, so, so uh, Susk and, uh, you know, and others have a bunch of papers where they do various tests, like they say, uh, well, look, quantum circuit complexity goes up linearly, but then it saturates after time two to the n, right? You know, you know the no quantum state on n qubits has a, requires a circuit of more than about two to the n size to prepare. Okay, but for independent quantum gravity reasons, you know, the wormhole length in quantum gravity should also uh, saturate after, you know, uh, about two to the n time. Okay, and you can do a few other tests where these two quantities match each other. Okay, so by, by string theory standards, this is a proof that they're the same. Uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, but then uh, okay, uh, but then you know, uh, Lenny uh, came to me with with a question. You know, so uh, so his challenge for me was, but can you prove that the circuit complexity actually does increase if I just take a collection of qubits, I apply the same unit u scrambling unitary to them over and over and over? You know, will the circuit complexity actually continue to go up? You know, under some generic conditions? And I said, you know, well, there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to prove anything like that, right? You know, complexity theorists are professional excuse makers, right? You know, that's just, you know, we can't prove P not equal to NP, we can't prove that, but you know, he said, okay, but conditional on, you know, one of you people's conjectures, you know, can you prove that? And then I said, all right, well, now we're talking. So, uh, so here's the theorem that we have. Um, it's that suppose that you, so the unitary that we keep applying, implements, let us say, a computation universal reversible cellular automaton. Okay, and this can just be a classical cellular automaton. That, that, that's fine. Uh, you know, and, and so, so, you know, I think some of the physicists conjectured uh, that what would, be, what would be relevant would be if this unitary uh, implements chaotic dynamics or something like that. But what I actually needed to prove this theorem was just computational universality. Okay, you know, no, it's clear that we need some condition on you, right? If you were the identity matrix, then it's not going to generate any, you know, complex states. Okay, but as long as you is computationally universal and we run it on an initial state that let's say is uh, n uh, uh, bell pairs, then one can show that after an exponential number of iterations, the quantum circuit complexity of the resulting state will be super polynomial in n uh, unless p space is contained in PP slash poly, which if you know what that means, good. Uh, if not, uh, it's bad, okay? Um. Okay, so a sketch of the uh, the proof uh, is that you know it, so it uses the theorem that uh, post BQP equals PP, and um, you you basically just uh, it's very simple. Uh, you say suppose by contradiction that the circuit complexity after exponential time uh, remain polynomial, then uh, you could just give a description of the circuit as advice to a post selected quantum computer, and that post selected quantum computer could then use that to prepare the state, and then could use that state to solve a p-space complete problem. Okay, how would it do that? Well, you know, because all you have to do is measure the first register and post-select on getting some particular input x that you care about. And then if you get that, then what's going to be in the second register will be x, but then t time evolved by you for an exponential amount of time. Okay, by, uh, you know, theorems about re reversible space equals deterministic space, that is going to be a p-space complete problem to see what, what u uh, uh, does to x when you iterate it for an exponential number of steps. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now, if you want exponential hardness as opposed to just super polynomial hardness, uh, you can get that as well. You just have to make a stronger complexity assumption. Okay. So yeah, uh, uh, you know, and it's clear that some complexity assumption has to be made here. For example, if P space uh, had polynomial sized quantum circuits, then the circuit complexity actually never would become more than polynomial. Okay, that, that, that's quite easy to see. Okay, so, so Lenny's belief that this quantum circuit complexity of this state does continue to increase, or is sort of dual to wormhole length, is conditional, at least, on the belief that P space does not have polynomial-sized quantum circuits. 
Okay, so you know, so so all of these questions, you know, lead to you know uh, into one of my favorite research directions in general, which is you know, which is which is interesting for even for reasons having nothing to do with quantum gravity. Okay, and this is just to understand more systematically uh, the uh, quantum circuit complexity of preparing particular states, you know, and applying particular unitary transformations, uh, you know, um, um, uh, rather than just solving uh, decision problems and so forth. Okay. Okay. This is, you know, also relevant for quantum money and a bunch of other things. Uh, here's one of my favorite example questions. Uh, we could ask, for every n qubit unitary transformation u, uh, is there some classical Boolean function f such that if we have an oracle for f, then we can realize u in polynomial time? Okay, uh, Greg Cooperberg and I raised this question in 2006. You know, it remains uh, one of my favorite open questions. Uh, and you know, you, well, you could think of it as like, I am giving you, you know, any computational ability you can possibly want, right? I'm making you like, you know, an optimal nerd, right? But now, you know, you know, even, you know, can even, you know, the smartest nerd in the world, you know, use their intelligence to lift a weight or something, okay? <laughs> you know, you know, now you have to actually physically implement this unitary. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, and this is directly relevant to this, uh, 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 to this AMPS problem. Like, like, let's say I wanted to say, uh, you know, could I prove, for example, that if you could solve um, um, P space complete problems efficiently, or if P equal P space, then the Harlow Hayden decoding problem would be easy. Okay, so can I prove a result that's the converse of the result that Harlow and Hayden proved? I don't know how to prove that, and it, and it hinges on this kind of question. Okay, uh, you know, it's, uh, by contrast, it is easy to show that for any n qubit state, uh, yes, there is some Boolean function such that if you could uh, compute it, then you could efficiently prepare that state. Okay, I'll leave that as an exercise for you if you're interested. Okay, but somehow when you're talking about applying a unitary rather than preparing a state, then the question is much harder. Okay, and uh, just to, you know, uh, as a final like uh, appetite wedding for this area. Okay, I have I have no uh, I've noted that there is a direct connection between uh, the uh, black hole, you know, firewall questions and quantum money. Okay, so you know, so I have a hardness result that says the Harlow Hayden decoding problem is hard, assuming that there's any one-way function that's hard to invert with a quantum computer. Okay, one can strengthen that to say the Harlow Hayden in a decoding problem is hard, assuming that there is any private key quantum money scheme with a, a small secret uh, which is secure. Okay, you know, now such a scheme can be constructed, you know, given any one-way function, but conceivably you don't need a one-way function to construct it. Okay, so that's a, you know, a, a weaker assumption. Okay, so uh, uh, from, you know, uh, so, so, so this, this, somehow this asking about the complexity of states, you know, bridges all the way from, you know, the, uh, the most exalted uh, human quest to the lowest, you know, from, you know, quantum gravity to, uh, you know, to uh, making money. So, uh, so I'll stop there, so thank you. Questions? Yeah, I seem to remember recently reading a paper that might have had Jonathan Oppenheim as one of the authors, yep. where they talk about um, doing some pre-computation yep. and ev evading AMPs and maybe mm -hmm. Harlow Hayden that way. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, so, so what Oppenheim and Unruh uh, showed was that uh, if you created a very, very special black hole, which is one that, you know, that is maximally entangled with a memory register, you know, a quantum computer that you have off to the side, okay, and now this black hole would take, would take ex you know, to just the preparation of the black hole would take exponential time, right, you would have to do exponential pre-computation just to, you know, to set all of this up, okay, so, you know, but then, you know, 
but 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 you know they say okay it's okay because it would all happen before you form the black hole right and then you would form this black hole and then this would be a black hole for which the Harlow Hayden decoding problem would be easy for which it could be done in polynomial time you know I have no problem with that I'm totally ready to say fine you go and make that kind of black hole you know you can create a firewall right you know I, I would view the point of the AMPS experiment as being to sort of explain why this why why we're not going to be able to feasibly create firewalls for astrophysical black holes. Yeah. Sure. Yep, yep, yep. Uh-huh. So the the fact that there it takes exponential time to see a problem uh and I I'm not sure if that's reassuring but you could also see a problem with exponentially small probability, right? If you just yeah. guess, you can get some non-negligible advantage uh, in a very small amount of time. Shouldn't that also bother us a lot? Um, well, there's an exponentially small probability of a lot of things happening. I mean, there's an exponentially small probability that, that, that a unicorn will, will come out of the black hole, right? And that would, you know, that would also appear to violate the, you know, predictions of GR and QFT, you know, except not really, because that unicorn does have a, you know, a non-zero amplitude. Uh, so, so I, you know, so I mean, for, for me, you know, life is too short to worry about things with, you know, one over X band probability. Hi. So m maybe we can simplify the problem and then view the two-sided black hole as, a, let's say, a tensor network, yeah. as Hartman and Madasena suggested. And maybe we can even, even simplify the problem by tiling random tensors. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, you have qubit chain and you're applying two qubit unitaries. Mm -hmm. And then in this situation, uh, is it known that complexity should grow? Um. I don't know. I'd be happy to talk about it offline. Uh, if you want to describe to me in more detail the system you have in mind, then you know we could we could try to look at it. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think we should move on to the next talk now. I'm sure people will have many more questions to ask uh, Scott at lunch. Let's uh, give him uh, thank the speaker once more. Thank you.